Here's Joel Richardson, author of the new book, The Mideast Beast. Hi, I'm Joel Richardson, and I want to take a few minutes to discuss the oracle of Ezekiel 38 and 39, most often referred to as the Battle of Gog of Magog. Now, this particular prophecy or oracle is one of the most important, one of the most controversial prophecies in all of Scripture. If you were to ask your average student of prophecy today what Ezekiel 38 and 39 is speaking of, almost universally you would hear that this is a prophecy speaking of a Russian-led invasion of Israel in the last days. Now, this idea was popularized largely through the uh, advent of the Schofield Reference Bible, which came out in 1909, and then it was re-released in 1917. And since that time, the Schofield Reference Bible has been a significant factor in terms of influencing dozens upon dozens of reference works and prophecy books since that time because the Schofield Reference Bible claimed or made the claim that the Battle of Gog and Magog is in fact a Russian-led invasion of Israel. Now just to highlight how incredibly influential this particular prophecy is, I want to read briefly a statement that was made by then Governor Ronald Reagan. This is 1971. Speaking to a room full of legislators, Reagan said this, Ezekiel tells us that Gog, the nation that will lead all other powers against Israel, will come out of the north. Biblical scholars have been saying for generations that Gog must be Russia. What other powerful nation is to the north of Israel? None. So you can see that this is, in fact, a prophecy that has been shaping the world. This is influencing world leaders, and as such, it's essential that students of prophecy pay attention to modern scholarship and how it is affecting the interpretation of this particular prophecy. Now, what I've done is I've gone through a handful of uh, various very popular prophecy websites and books, uh, and if you're to Google Gog of Magog, you'll get very similar maps. And just to highlight how overwhelmingly popular this idea is, that Gog is a, uh, an invader from Russia, I've pulled out a handful of maps, and I want you to walk through uh, these maps with me just to see where the overwhelming majority of prophecy students are looking for the coming forward of Gog and Magog. So in this first map, you can see that you have Magog is essentially in Central Asia, the Central Asian nations, and then Rosh is highlighted in red, and of course the idea is that uh, Gog, the leader of this invasion, is from the land of Magog. And here you can see that he's coming out of the region of Russia as well as Central Asia. Uh, in this second map, once again, Magog is placed up in Russia. And it's from Russia that the invasion proceeds forth down south to Israel. Here we have a third map. Once again, Magog is placed in the land of Russia uh, as well as the Ukraine, but up in northern Russia. And it's from Russia that the invasion uh, ascends down to Israel. Here we have another map, once again Magog placed in the far, far north of Russia. Uh, one more map, Magog placed in Russia. Again, if you were to scour the internet, scour virtually any prophecy book from the past 100 years, almost every prophecy book is going to place uh, this invader in the land of Russia. Now, here's, here's what I want you to do with me, is to just look at just a few very brief maps from a handful of scholarly reference Bible atlases. And as you can see, I'm a bit of a, uh, an atlas nerd. For my new book, Mideast Beast, The Scriptural Case for an Islamic Antichrist, I've walked through uh, abundant resources to draw out what does modern biblical scholarship say to this issue. So in the first map, I want you to look now. This is from the, uh, the New Moody Atlas of the Bible. And in this first map, you can see that they've placed Magog in Asia Minor, or the modern-day nation of Turkey. Okay, so that's the new Moody Atlas of the Bible. Uh, in the second one here, we have the Zondervan Atlas of the Bible. Again, each of these various atlases uh, put together by teams of highly interdisciplinary scholars. Uh, and once more, they placed Magog squarely in Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey. Uh, third Bible atlas... We've got the Holman Bible Atlas, another excellent Bible Atlas. Uh, once more, as you can see, they've placed uh, Magog squarely 
uh, in modern day Turkey. And then lastly, we've got the IVP Atlas of Bible History. Uh, once again, Magog squarely in Turkey. And again, we could do this, we could walk through, uh, you know, dozens of atlases. But the point that I want to leave you with is this. Why is it that when we look at the various scholarly reference works and compare them to the numerous prophecy books uh, that you and I have been studying for the past 30 years, why is there such a radical discrepancy? And the reason is because modern scholarship has long rejected the idea that Magog uh, is in Russia. And so while most prophecy students are not aware of this, while most prophecy students have not caught up with modern scholarship, it's essential that as students of the Bible who are concerned with truth, that we would align our particular prophetic ideas uh, and interpretations with modern uh, conservative evangelical scholars. So in my new book, Mideast Beast, The Scriptural Case for an Islamic Antichrist, I walk the reader th carefully through Ezekiel 38 and 39, numerous other prophecies, and bring them up to date with modern scholarship. Again, the times that we live in are far too important not to take these things seriously. And uh, I'd invite you to join me as we walk through the prophecies of the Bible in order that we can understand how we should be living today. Thank you. New York Times best-selling author Joel Richardson's newest release, The Mideast Beast, available now. Here's Joel Richardson, author of the new book, The Mideast Beast. Hi, I'm Joel Richardson, and I would like to discuss the subject of Ezekiel 38 and 39, most often referred to as the Battle of Gog of Magog. Now, in a previous discussion, we looked at a series of maps, some created by popular prophecy teachers, and then a handful created by more scholarly Bible atlases. And what we saw when we looked at and compared the uh, distinctions between these two different sources is that most of the popular prophecy books placed uh, Magog and this coming invasion of Israel in Russia. When we looked at the many scholarly Bible atlases, on the other hand, we saw that they universally placed Magog in Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey. Now, I want to discuss the reasoning and how the, the idea of how many come to the conclusion that, in fact, Magog is uh, in Russia. And the reasoning is very simple. It first begins with a quote that comes from the uh, Jewish historian Josephus. And he was a first century uh, historian. He was a Jew who was a traitor to the Jews who went over to the Romans. And in his, in his uh, works, he has this quote. He says, Magog founded the Magogians, thus named after him, who by the Greeks are called Scythians. So because of this quote, many have concluded that Magog is a reference to the ancient Scythian peoples. And then, of course, when we look at where the Scythians dwelt, most often they are, uh, they are seen to be dwelling in modern-day Russia as well as the Ukraine all the way over to Central Asia. But there's a significant, in fact, a fatal flaw with this reasoning. So again, the idea is that Gog is from Magog, and then Magog is a reference to the Scythian peoples who lived in Russia. And again, the reasoning sounds very simple. The problem, however, is that modern biblical scholars use the interpretive method referred to as the historical grammatical method. Now, the historical grammatical method looks to any particular prophecy and it looks at the original context of the prophecy. So the idea is to understand how Ezekiel himself would have understood the various names that were in his oracle. We're not concerned with how Josephus would have understood the terms. Josephus lived roughly 700 years after Ezekiel. So the question that the uh, interpreter using the historical grammatical method is going to use is how did Ezekiel understand these prophecies in his day? Where did the Magogians or the Scythians live in Ezekiel's day? Because the Scythians were a migratory people. They were constantly on the move. Now, when we look at uh, history, it's replete with testimonies to the fact that during Ezekiel's day, the Scythian peoples lived in modern-day Turkey, ancient Asia Minor. In fact, there's a city 
on the uh, the western portion of Turkey, referred to as Heropolis, uh, sometimes referred to as Scythopolis, and also referred to as Magog. So this was the region that was planted, this was the city that was planted by the Magogians uh, or the Scythians, and again this is in modern day Turkey. So again, historical testimony is clear that the Scythians in Ezekiel's day dwelt in modern day Turkey. Now what many people do is instead of using the historical grammatical method, instead they use something that I refer to as the bloodline lineage migration method, which is to say they try to trace the, the bloodline and the migration patterns of the ancient Magogians who became the Scythians, and they try to tra trace them into the various nations where they live in modern times. Now unfortunately what many people do is they trace them up to the first century when uh, Josephus identified them as, as dwelling in the region north of the Black Sea, which is actually more, more like Ukraine rather than Russia. Uh, and then they stop there. So it's a very selective method uh, where they're, they're trying to use the bloodline lineage migration method of interpretation, but then they stop in the first century. The question is, why stop there? If we're going to trace it all the way to the first century, 700 years removed from Ezekiel's prophecy, why not continue tracing it right up into modern times? Now, if we do that with regard to the various Japhetic peoples that are listed in Ezekiel's prophecy, so Gomer, Magog, Meshech, Tubal, and Togorma, if we trace these people, we end up looking to the modern day nations of the United States, uh, of virtually all of Europe, of South Africa, of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, even Mexico. And if we're consistent in our usage of the bloodline lineage uh, migration method, we have to include all of those nations. Now, I haven't seen a, uh, a book called The Coming Mexican Invasion of Israel, uh, but if these interpreters were consistent, they would be forced to, in fact, conclude that Mexico would be uh, included in this coming invasion. Fortunately, uh, modern Bible scholars are uh, consistent in their testimony that Magog, during Ezekiel's day, was in Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey. Uh, in my new book, Mideast Beast, The Scriptural Case for an Islamic Antichrist, I walk the reader carefully through Ezekiel's oracle and bring them up to speed with modern-day scholarship as Bereans, as those that are concerned with diligently studying the scriptures and aligning our views with, uh, with truth, as well as with uh, modern scholarship as it aligns with truth, uh, it's essential that we look afresh at Ezekiel's oracle because it is incredibly relevant and pressing for our times. Uh, the intensity and the urgency of the hour demands no less. Times best-selling author Joel Richardson's newest release, The Mideast Beast, available now. Here's Joel Richardson, author of the new book, The Mideast Beast. Hi, I'm Joel Richardson, and I'd like to discuss for the next few minutes the idea of replacement theology. Now, replacement theology, in a nutshell, is the idea that the church has replaced Israel throughout the Old Testament. And for those that are careful uh, students of the scriptures, careful interpreters, know well that those that hold to replacement theology really do hermeneutical violence to dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds of passages throughout the Old Testament. So in looking at these various passages that speak of the nation of Israel and the people of Israel, uh, and essentially the Lord's love letters to his people Israel, the church simply inserts themselves into these passages and tries to retroactively reinterpret them and take all of the promises of blessings and all of the Lord's promises of provision and applying them uh, to the modern-day Christian church. Now, while most conservative uh, premillennialist or futurist interpreters of scripture recognize replacement theology as, as really being uh, a perversion of a proper understanding of the scriptures. In fact, many conservative evangelical futurist premillennialists commit this very same error, not with regard to Israel, but with regard to Israel's enemies. And so, this might sound like a new idea, but I want to look at a, a prophecy from Numbers 24. And of course, we could look at 
dozens of prophecies, but I want to show how we actually quite often commit the same error that many of those that we criticize for trying to replace Israel to mean something other than what it really means, to, to essentially allegorize or spiritualize Israel to mean something other than what its clear context means. I want to look at Numbers 24 to explain this, uh, this problem. So this is Numbers 24. Uh, verse 17, and then verses 17 through 20. And this is the prophecy of Balaam and Balak. Now, Israel had come up out of uh, Egypt. They'd been wandering in the promised land for roughly 39 years. And Balak was the king of Moab. And he was paying Balaam, who was a prophet, to essentially curse the Hebrew peoples. And so this is the backdrop for this, uh, this passage. King Balak wants this prophet to curse the Hebrew peoples. They're standing on this great overlook, looking down at the Hebrew peoples. And instead of cursing uh, the Hebrews, this is what uh, Balaam says. He looks at Balak and he says, Come, I will advise you what this people, that's the Hebrew people, will do to your people in the last days. And that, that, that specific phrase in the Hebrew, Akariath Yom, in the most uh, literal sense, is always a reference to the end times. It, it, can, it can reference the latter days, but its ultimate truest sense is the last days. And then he begins to make one of the clearest messianic prophecies in all of the Old Testament, often uh, overlooked, but a powerful messianic prophecy. And this is what Balaam says. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will rise up out of Jacob. The scepter will rise up out of Israel. And then what does this, this ruler, this scepter, this Messiah rising up out of Israel, what does he do? What does the Spirit inspire Balaam to speak? And he says this, He will batter the brow of Moab. He will destroy all the sons of Sheth, or the sons of Tumult. Edom shall be a possession. Mount Seir, which was a prominent mountain uh, within Edom, will, be, will become his possession. So the Messiah will destroy Edom and Moab, Mount Seir, that these peoples will become a possession of the Messiah. And uh, while Israel will do valiantly, out of Jacob one shall have dominion, and he will destroy the remnants of the peoples uh, of that city. Then Balaam looks on Amalek, and this is another uh, group of people that lived slightly north of Moab and Edom. These were the peoples that lived in modern-day Jordan, extending all the way down into uh, northwest Saudi Arabia. Now he's turning his attention to Amalek that were a bit more uh, in the north and spread out throughout that, that greater region. And he says, uh, he took up his discourse against Amalek, and he says, Amalek was the first among the nations, but its end will be in utter destruction. So in the context of this very clear messianic prophecy, we have references to Moab, Edom, Amalek, Mount Seir, the peoples that live today to the east of uh, Israel. In ancient times, they lived to the east, the desert, the desert peoples that lived to the east of Israel. And today, these are the regions where the Muslim majority peoples of Jordan and Saudi Arabia, the Ishmaelites, so to speak, uh, dwell throughout these regions. But see, here's what we do. Here's what many people do is we look to these prophecies and while casting spursions on the uh, those that replace Israel uh, or allegorize Israel throughout the scriptures and saying this is poor hermeneutics, many times many conservative uh, interpreters look at passages such as this and we say, well, this is not a reference to uh, modern-day Jordan or to the modern-day Eastern peoples. These are simply vague references to any end-time enemy of God's people. And we really allegorize these many, many names found throughout the scriptures into oblivion. And again, we could look at dozens upon dozens of very similar passages where the prophets name names, where they point to the regions, for instance, of Egypt or Syria or Lebanon or uh, the Palestinian regions of Gaza and the West Bank, where they point to Iran and Iraq or Babylon. All of these regions as the, the peoples in the regions and the locations that will be the primary recipients of the Messiah's judgments when he returns. And instead of simply identifying them according to the names that the scriptures give them, uh, 
we go, well, these are just these are just allegorical passages that refer to any real bad guy, any guy that's against uh, Israel or against God, and we allegorize them into oblivion, and we commit the exact precise hermeneutical error that we fault those that do the same thing with Israel for. We become replacement theologians. Now, in my new book, The Mideast Beast, The Scriptural Case for an Islamic Antichrist, I walk the student of prophecy, the careful student of scripture through numerous prophecies throughout the prophets, looking to these many nations. I discuss uh, the most responsible hermeneutic or method of interpretation to understand and interpret these many names in order to understand how they apply to our days, how they apply to the days to come in the day of the Lord when Jesus returns. It is essential in light of all that's taking place in the earth today that we pay careful attention to what the prophets have been speaking for thousands of years. If, if, if all evidences, uh, which they appear to be, come to pass, then in fact these things which we see throughout the prophets are even now right on our horizon. It's time to sit up and begin to take very careful notice. Here's Joel Richardson, author of the new book, The Mideast Beast. Hi, I'm Joel Richardson, and I'd like to discuss what I refer to as the harbingers for the whole earth. Now, in the past several months, many Americans have been gripped by Messianic Rabbi Jonathan Kahn's book, The Harbinger, as well as the documentary, The Isaiah 910 Judgment. Now, what both of these works have done is they've brought forward uh, many significant trumpet blasts from heaven from the ancient Hebrew prophets. By comparing contemporary events that have taken place in the United States over the past dozen or so years with some of the prophecies of Isaiah, many Americans have become aware of the fact that the Lord is warning America concerning an impending judgment. Now, while many of these prophecies are absolutely uh, significant. I believe the United States needs to pay attention to these things. And in fact, the Lord is giving us the opportunity to repent and to avert these judgments. It's also essential that we understand that the original context of Isaiah's prophecies is not for the United States. Of course, the original context are the events that were taking place in Isaiah's day and in the events that would take place shortly after Isaiah in the land of Israel with regard to the invading uh, armies of the Assyrians. And throughout the prophecies of Isaiah as well as Micah, there are numerous references to the Assyrian. Now, the point that I want to draw out is that while many Americans have become aware of the harbingers or the warning signs that the Lord is giving to this nation, uh, beyond that, we need to understand the fuller picture of Isaiah and recognize the harbingers that the Lord has given to the whole world. And so, what I want to do is look at just a handful uh, of early church theologians and some modern day theologians, all who testify to the fact that references to the Assyrian and the Assyrians throughout Isaiah and Micah are in fact references to the Antichrist. Because what Rabbi Khan has done is shown that while America has received its, its initial judgment from God through the vessel of the modern-day spiritual Assyrians, if you will, through the radical uh, Islamists that attacked the World Trade Centers and the Pentagon, that in fact that these, these modern-day spiritual Assyrians, if you will, are, are the Lord's rod of chastisement, not just for the United States, but for Israel and for the whole world. And so many scholars today will say, well, no, these references to the Assyrian, these are not references to the Antichrist. These are merely historical. They have no uh, end time relevance. Well, going back to the early years of the church, we have Hippolytus of Rome, one of the most important Christian theologians of the third century. And speaking of the Antichrist, this is what Hippolytus had to say. He said, that these things then are said of no one else but that tyrant and shameless one, an adversary of God, we shall show in what follows. But Isaiah also speaks thus, 
And it shall come to pass that when the Lord has performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will punish the stout mind, the king of Assyria, and the greatness of the glory of his eyes. So here Hippolytus, in commenting on the prophecies of Isaiah, is clearly likening the ancient Assyrian to the last day's Antichrist. Elsewhere, when referring to the many prophecies about the Assyrian found in Micah and Isaiah, Hippolytus stated quite directly that the Assyrian is another name for the Antichrist. So again, this is going back to the third century. Those early believers, certainly they were not uh, infallible, but certainly they were much closer to the fountain than we are 2,000 years later. Next, we have Victorinus. He was the Bishop of Pitau. He was uh, an early Christian bishop. He was martyred for his faith. And he is the author of the earliest complete commentary on the book of Revelation in our possession. And so Victorinus, in his commentary, states that the Assyrian mentioned in Micah 5.5 5, is in fact the Antichrist. He says, There shall be peace for our land, and they shall encircle Assyria, that is the Antichrist. So again, this belief was widely held amongst the early believers. Later we had Lactantius. He was another early church writer from the third century. He stated that the Antichrist would come forward precisely from that region. Here's what he said. He said, a king shall arise out of Syria, born of an evil spirit, the overthrower and the destroyer of the human race, who shall destroy that which is left by the former evil together with himself. That king will not only be most disgraceful in himself, he will also be a prophet of lies. And power will be given to him to do signs and wonders by the sight of him that he may entice men to endure him. So again, Lactantius referring to the Antichrist as coming out of the region of ancient Syria. Now again, ancient Syria is a bit different than modern day Syria, the nation of Syria. It was actually quite a, a larger region. Moving up to modern times, we have Clarence Larkin. Uh, he was born in 1850, died in 1924. He was an American Baptist pastor, Bible teacher, uh, most well known for his book, Dispensational Truth. Uh, roughly 100 years after it was published today, it is still uh, a bestseller. Okay, This is a deeply influential, widely respected scholar among dispensationalists. And Larkin says this, the king of the north was the king of Syria, and his character and conduct is described in Daniel 11 as similar to that of the little horn, so he's speaking of Daniel's prophecies, that came out of one of the four horns. And he says this, It is clear that Antichrist is to come from Syria. We are to understand, therefore, that the king of the north, in Daniel 11, uh, is the king of Syria, which included Assyria. This fixes the locality of where the Antichrist shall come. So Clarence Larkin clearly understood what the scriptures teach, that the Antichrist will come forward from the region of ancient Assyria. Another modern day, widely respected scholar and prophecy teacher was Arthur W. Pink. Uh, he was born in 1886, died in 1952. He was an English evangelist, a biblical scholar, well known for his work, The Antichrist. And Arthur Pink also refers to the Antichrist as coming forward out of the Middle East from the former region of the ancient Assyrian Empire. Here's what Pink says. He says, we have seen that the scriptures which help us to determine the direction from which he will arise, speak of him under the title of the little horn. Now the first thing this title denotes is that he is a king, the king of Assyria. Okay, so once again, ancient scholars, modern day scholars, leaders in the early church, modern day widely respected Christian prophecy teachers point to the fact that the Antichrist will come forward out of Assyria. Now these harbingers that we've seen here in the United States and throughout the world were spoken of clearly throughout Isaiah and, uh, and perhaps even most clearly in Micah 5.5, 5, the famous messianic prophecy that speaks of the Bethlehem-born Messiah that would specifically defend the nation of Israel from the Assyrian when the Assyrian crosses into the borders and invades the land of Israel. Clearly a reference to Jesus himself uh, engaging in a military battle against the Antichrist, who Micah, as well as Isaiah, refers to as the Assyrian. 
So as many Americans are waking up to the powerful uh, hints and warning signs that Messianic Rabbi Jonathan Kahn have, has drawn out in his book and subsequent documentary, it's most essential that students of Bible prophecy look to the scriptures, to their original context, to understand the fuller picture, to understand the warning signs and the harbingers that the Lord has shown us thousands of years ago that are now coming to fruition in our day, that we can look to the Middle East, understand the prophecies, understand what is taking place, because by all measures, it appears as though these prophecies are even right now on a horizon, about to be fulfilled. The urgency of the hour demands that we pay attention to these things. In my new book, The Mideast Beast, The Scriptural Case for an Islamic Antichrist, I walk the student of uh, prophecy and scripture carefully through the many prophecies of Isaiah and Micah, showing that, again, these ancient Hebrew prophets were clearly pointing to many of the events in the Middle East today and pointing to the region from which the Antichrist would come forward.